All right, settle in for a long story. <laughs> when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to our God. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you have brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it, and they have said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, Yahweh said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Holy One. Beloved, he said, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, and Israel to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Then Yahweh relented and did not bring on God's people the disaster God had threatened. <laughs> Oh. 
Holy One, I am mindful in this moment, in this one moment, right now, all over this planet, there are many other human beings struggling with who you are, why you are, what you're about, and how you could let things go on that are going on. In Gaza, in Israel, in Ukraine, in parts of the world that uh, don't capture the imagination of whoever populates my news feed and headlines. The meanness that we unleash on each other as a species goes seemingly unchecked. And we wonder who you are and why you are and what are you going to do about it. And we're afraid. Even sitting here in the safe environs of little Ashland, Oregon, we have fear. Oh God, we claim to pray to you and have an idea about you and we know nothing. But in this moment, in, the, in this moment as we're together, I ask you would penetrate our hearts and that you would give us something to carry forward as we try to live what we believe and what we believe about you. Oh God, help us. Help us speak to us. Quiet those voices of fear that torment us. Oh Holy One, please. 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 Amen. Amen. So, if you think the reading that Becky gave to us was awful, <laughs> it gets much worse as the 32nd chapter of Exodus unfolds. It gets a lot worse in that chapter. And to try to, to give us some context for what's going on, I, I want to remind you of, of a couple of things. Last week, the text given to us was the giving of the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words. And where historically we find the, 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 the people of Israel, the, the Jewish nation, 
has been liberated from slavery in Egypt and they are wandering in the wilderness. And they're afraid and they're frightened because the wilderness is a scary place. There's not enough food and water and, and there are dangers that look, lurk all around, uh, either from other human beings that want to wipe you out or animals. And so it's a perilous place to be, the wilderness. And the one that they have taken great confidence in, in Moses, has been long away. He's been up on a mountain in a high-level conference with this being called God. And Moses has his sidekick Joshua with him. And they've been long away and the people become frightened with the uncertainty that surrounds them. There are nations around them that want to wipe them out. They're in a place where there's not a lot of provision. And so they're plagued with incredible uncertainty. And when human beings as a species, when we're uncertain, we like to fashion idols. That's what we do to try to bring some security. What should I do? Show me what to do. And so we, we like to make idols. It's part of being human beings. And so Aaron, the brother of Moses, the high priest, Aaron, sees what's going on and concocts this great plan and tells the people to bring their, their jewelry, their gold. I, if you remember in the Exodus story, as the people of Israel were leaving Egypt, uh, the Egyptians were so afraid of them because of the 10 plagues, the Egyptians gave them a bunch of gold on their way out of town. Yeah, some people think it was back, pay, back wages for 400 years of slavery, but at any rate, the Egyptians walk, or the Israel, Israelite people walk out of Egypt with all this gold from the Egyptians. And I don't know if you've ever handled gold, it's quite heavy. And so now you're out in the wilderness with all this heavy metal stuff lugging around, and there's not a shopping mall within shouting distance to spend a shekel. So they have all this worthless stuff, this gold. And Aaron comes up with a great plan. We'll bring it here and we'll show you what this God is like. And so they bring their gold and they craft a golden calf. They have artisans come and create this statue of what God is like, violating the first two commands that we already read about last week in our text. And so then the scene shifts to the mountaintop where Yahweh and Moses are in this high level meeting. And it's, it's almost laughable what goes on. It's like two, two parents arguing about the, uh, the kids and how awful they are. And Yahweh says to Moses, you better get down there and take care of your kids because they're causing a lot of problems and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And Moses, wait, 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 wait. They're your kids, they're not my kids. And God says, you better do something or I'm gonna wipe them out. And Moses said, oh, no, 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 God, no, God, settle down. Because if you wipe them out, then all the other peoples around here are gonna think you're some kind of a bad God or a weenie God, and you just brought your own people out to let them die, and you're not the loving, powerful God that we all know you are, and so you can't do that. And God says, you better get down there and take care of this. So Moses scurries down the mountain with Joshua, and he's got the two tablets of the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. I mean, these are sacred, holy objects, and he's got them. And he gets down there and sees what's going on. And he's so mad, he takes the two stone tablets and breaks them and crashes them. And he starts yelling at Aaron, his brother, what you numbskull, what are you doing? Think of Barney and, and Andy, you know, what the, what are you thinking of? And Aaron goes, look, it wasn't me, wasn't me. They just threw the gold in the fire and out popped this calf. I was just, I mean, this is in the text. I'm not making this up. And so Moses gets so mad, he has him melt down the golden calf, beats it into powder, puts it in the water, and makes all the people drink the water with the gold calf in it to choke on what they'd done. And then he takes, he, he makes it worse. He calls the Levites together. Moses does. Has them take their swords out and go through the whole people of Israel and kill 3,000 of their brothers and sisters and kinsmen to atone for this horrific thing they've done. 
I mean, it's a bloodbath. It's crazy. And so what do we do with this text? And if you think, well, this is just the craziness of a couple of millennia ago, you haven't been looking at the news this week. Because the same insanity is going on. I have been so deeply, deeply impacted by events in Gaza and Israel. My mother was Jewish. My mother and grandmother hid the fact because they were always afraid of being marginalized or segregated against because they were Jewish. And so it was a family secret growing up. We don't tell anybody that. And so I read these events and I feel in an umbilical cord kind of way connected to the horror and the insanity that is going on in Gaza, in Jerusalem. These are my people being slaughtered and slaughtering. It's awful. What do we do about it? What do we do with that? What is the craziness? Where is this God? And, and the weight of my job here in this church has hit me powerfully this week. The insanity of you good people coming and, and listening to me rant and rave like I have any idea what this being is like. Like I'm going to stand here and tell you what God is like, what God wants. Like somehow I know or have a clue. And I will be honest with you in all humility, I am clueless. This is so beyond what my head can take in. I, I've been rereading a, a book I love, uh, the Book of Equanimity, which is a, a Buddhist book on a hundred koans, which are Japanese riddles, nonsensical riddles to blow your head open and help you have an awakening. And it's uh, written by a guy named Gary or Jerry Shashin Wick, uh, trying to help unpack these koans to make them a little understandable. And, and one of the lines he has in the book I love, he says, not knowing is most intimate, which refers to another one of these koans. And what I take away from what he's trying to say is when we pretend to know, we're so full of what we think we know that we miss what's really going on. And so not knowing, having an open mind, realizing how little we know opens us to the possibilities and to the realities around us. It's not unlike the Taoist say in the Tao Te Chung, uh, where Lao Tzu writes, you know, anything that's, that's living is malleable and flexible. If, it, if it's dead, it's hard and stiff, like a stick is hardened because it's dead, or a body that has rigor mortis, it's hard and stiff, or like a creed or a doctrine, if it's hard and stiff, it's dead. And it does not offer life. And so we talk about like, we know what God wants, God there, and we know nothing. And I'm aware of that. And so I, I offer you, look, I don't know. But after over 50 years of struggling with this being that we call God and trying to make sense of it all, I'll offer with you what I've come to believe, not that I know, but what I believe. And if it's helpful for you, I just humbly offer as best I can. So a couple of things I would like to be able to say is look, I know we all make idols. It's what we do when we're afraid and when we don't know what's going on. We want security. We want something to tell us what to do and how to behave. And our idols are simply ways to try to domesticate and tame this wild God that the Bible alludes to. And, and, and the Bible, I got to be honest, the Hebrew scriptures, our Old Testament, whatever you want to call it, there are numerous gods in the Bible, even in, for the Jewish God. There was El or El Shaddai, which was one way to refer to God, and there's Yahweh, 
another. So even it's not one idea or concept. There's multiple ideas of this being among the Jewish people, let alone all the other gods that the other peoples had. There was Baal and Ashrath and Ra and Ram and the list goes on, Zeus and Juno. There were a lot of gods around. And everybody wanted tribal gods, God to protect them, like I referenced last week, the, the tiny god syndrome. We all want a god that's going to protect me and the people like me and smote everybody else. Everybody wants their tribal god. And as the Hebrew scriptures unfold, Yahweh is one of these tribal gods. And so Aaron crafts the calf to make the idol of what this God is supposedly like. And Moses gets upset and Yahweh gets upset that this calf does not represent. And, and so what is this God being? I, I, so here's just what I've come to believe. One of the things I do believe about this divine other is that this divine other is connected to or accessed in the present moment. Not in the past, not in the future, not in my dreams or imaginations, but in the reality of this moment, do we have access to this being? And I, I take that in Exodus chapter 3, when this being self-discloses to Moses. Moses is at the burning bush, realizes something's going on, and says, all right, who are you? And this being says, I am who I am. Not I was who I was or who I, I will be who I will be. I am. It's in the present moment. You will access me. You will connect with me in the present moment. So that's one of the things I've come to believe about this being. I also believe this being is with us. Now, when I say that, I don't mean with us particularly like God's with us and not with them. No, God's with everybody. God's with us. I believe that God is with all the other churches in town and the mosques and the synagogues. God's with all of us. God can't not be with us. Because another thing I believe about this being is this being is compassionate and loves us. Just as we are, just who we are. And then the thing this text brings out that's something I have come to believe that's really problematic for a lot of people is this text indicates that this being, this divine other, feels, has feelings, has emotions. The God presented in this text gets angry and repents, changes this, this God changes this God's mind. He's going to do something, decides I'm going to do something else. What do we do with that? Now, much Christian theology which was deeply influenced, and I would say hijacked, by Greek philosophy, teaches that God can't have emotions or feelings because that's changeable, and God is not changeable. God is constant. And so there's this, so theologians come to a text like this and they'll explain it away. Well, this is an anthropomorphic view of God. The writers were just trying to put human uh, attributes onto God so that we could have some understanding of God. That's an anthropomorphism. It's a big word. It means we give human attributes like we say, the leaves were crying in the rain. Well, leaves don't cry, but that's an anthropomorphism to give it a, a, a human quality to an inanimate thing or to a species, like to an animal or, or to another being like a guy. So, and I love, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, the genius, who argues vehemently against this and says that texts like this are not an anthropomorphism of God, but we have feelings and emotions, and that's because our feelings and emotions are theomorphic. They make us like God, because God has feelings. We're made in the human image, or the, the divine image, and so we have feelings to represent that God has feelings. And Heschel goes on to say, if God doesn't have feelings, explain creation. God didn't want to be alone, so God created all that is so that God could love and care. God has feelings. 
Heschel screams against all of this Greek philosophy. And I agree in, the, in this text. So what do we do with a God who has feelings? And as I've thought about this text and the events of this week, I thought, what does God feel like this week? As God looks at this planet, what is God feeling this week? And I've been undone. I can't imagine. This planet, this creation where God said, and it's all good. And what we as a species have not just done to each other, but what we've done to the planet. What we've done to the natural resources and the beauty, the gift of this earth. And to the animals and to each other. I imagine God had a bad week. As I think of a God who feels. Now one of the reasons I want you to know why I am a Christian because I believe the wonderful rabbi from Nazareth we call Jesus came to teach us that this Yahweh, the God formerly known as Yahweh, you know how X is now formerly known as Twitter and Prince was the artist formerly known as Prince. Well, the God formerly known as Yahweh, according to Jesus, is a being that loves all people just as they are. God, this being of, of Jesus's connection, loves Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and Christians and even us. This God loves all people and wants the best for all people. Gay, straight, young, old, fat, thin, poor, rich. This being loves us all and wants us to care for each other. And that's why I got to be honest with you guys, this relational agreement we're going to talk about after church is so important to me because it's a way for us to try to really implement our care for each other and, and, and to declare this is how we're going to treat each other here with kindness, with respect. And we want to, we want to declare that in a very firm and vital way. And that's why we're going to talk about it. Well, as I thought about the events of this week, I, I, I thought of several stories from my own life. And I think I've shared one or two of these before, but a number of years ago, I was living in England. And uh, I was living and working with some churches as part of leadership team of a network of churches in places called Windsor and Slough and Reading and Maidenhead and all these little suburbs outside of London. And uh, while I was there, one week, a, uh, a commuter train from Reading went into Paddington Station. And for whatever reason, the brakes on the train didn't work, and the train crashed into Paddington Station. And about 30 folks were killed. And there were a couple uh, folks killed that were family members of people in our church in Reading. And I can remember being at church that Sunday. and. Uh, so there was a lot going on and somebody stood up to give a testimony that she was saying her husband was sick on the day of the train wreck and he works in London and had he not been sick, he would have been on that train and likely could have died. And so everybody starts shouting, oh, praise God that he was sick and that God spared his life. And I'm looking around, there's a couple of other folks that had family members die. And I'm thinking, what about them? Are we saying God doesn't love their family member or God doesn't love them? See, every time we try to make this teeny God that's going to get us out of trouble, it creates problems. And so what do we do with this being? And, one of the, and what I'm alluding to is the problem, in theological terms, it's called theodicy. That's a code word for a big theological term. And what it means is if God's all-powerful and all-loving, why is there so much pain and suffering and evil? And nobody's got a good answer for that. Frederick Buechner, a, a, a theologian I absolutely love, has written, um, we can say three things 
and none of and and we can't have them make sense. He says we say God is all powerful, God is all good and loving, and terrible things happen. Anybody can make two of those three statements work together. Nobody can make all three. And the problem is evil. The problem of evil, as we've been seeing in our news feeds all week, is the greatest problem for religious faith, according to Beekner. And while he doesn't have any concrete solution to this problem, he does offer some really wonderful advice. He says, all wise, all powerful, all loving, all knowing, we bore both God and ourselves to death with our chatter. God is not to be expressed, only experienced. And I believe in the present moment. I had a conversation a couple of years ago with a, with a chaplain from Providence Hospital. I was a hospice chaplain. She was a Catholic nun. She was a chaplain in the hospital. We were talking and I was telling her about one of the people that just came on our hospice service who was a wonderful man. He was, a, I think, a Baptist minister for much of his life. His wife, his loving partner of over 60 years had died. And within a month of her death, while he was grieving, he was diagnosed with bone cancer, had horrible cancer in his spine, tumors pressing against his spine. The pain was so uncontrollable, even morphine couldn't help it. He's writhing in pain on his bed. He's grieving the death of his wife. And I had talked to his kids. His kids told me he was a wonderful man. He was a really loving father and he was a wonderful minister. So here's a man of faith grieving his life partner in horrible pain. And my friend, the chaplain, looked at me and said, why won't God just take him? And I looked at her and I said, is that what you believe? That God kills people? That God, because if we're going to say, God, come kill him, take him home, then does God take... The, the babies that were murdered in Israel this week, or the, the families in Gaza that have been murdered. This, does God kill them? And she goes, well, that, that's not what I mean. You know what I mean. Because I had read all the same stuff she had. And she goes, yeah, I, I mean, God calls us. God calls us home. And I can remember, I looked at her and said, then don't answer the telephone. Because <laughs> that's me. And she got mad at me. Well, what do you think? What do you believe? And I looked at her and I, I don't know where this came from, but I just said, you know, I believe, I believe that when we die, God cries. I believe God cries over all the missed opportunities that we had to receive love and to give love because we were too afraid, too afraid we weren't worthy of it. I think God cries over the cruelty that we unleash upon each other. Hamas, Jewish, gay, straight, all the uncruelty, all the cruelties that we, Ukrainian, Russian, that we just unleash on each other. And I think God cries over the fact that we have no clue how much this being longs to have relationship with us and we don't clue in. I think God cries. I, my friends, I have come to believe in a crying God, and I think God's crying a lot this week. Do I know this? No. Can I stand here and say this? No. This is just what I believe. And I believe God wants us to cry and to work together. As small a group as we are, as old as we are, the limited resources we are, that's why this idea of church, of being a project, is so important to me that we can be a witness that doesn't have to be that way. We can get along. We can be kind to each other. We can support each other. We can love each other. Even though we're afraid, we've all got our own idols that we're trying to get rid of. In the midst of it all, we believe in this being that calls the best out of us. And how can we give the best to each other? And we're trying to do that. We're not perfect. We're not the best at it. But we're trying. That's why this is so important to me. And I know I've talked a lot longer than I should have, but I'll close with a good Christian theologian I like, a guy named Dallas Willard. 
Dallas Willard wrote this. He says, the acid test for any theology is this. Is the God that is presented one that can be loved with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength? Because if the God presented is not one you can love with all that you are, then, don't, then it's just another idol fashioned out of gold in the middle of the wilderness. Oh, my friends, let us continue stumbling around and trying as best we can. Because at some level, in some way, I think it brings some joy to the crying God that I've brought to our minds this morning. May it be so. Amen. Amen.